with you for Bible study once again. We're going into beginning lesson number five uh, this evening, uh, dealing with the origin of human civilization. Uh, you know, a lot of people look around at the world today and they think that uh, uh, this really is sort of God's world. You know, we're a Christian nation and uh, uh, therefore they, uh, they talk about that, how the United States and, and, and the Western world, that uh, we have Western Christian civilization. And they look at the customs and the ideas and the attitudes that, that, uh, of people. They look at the uh, holidays that are observed. Uh, and they, most people think these are Christian holidays. It's important that we understand the real origin of human civilization. You know, there are those who think that, that the way the millennium is going to come about, uh, much of, most of mainstream Protestant uh, teaching uh, is that it will simply be as more as the kingdom of God is set up in the hearts of men everywhere that, that more and more people will sort of be brought in and they expect that civilization just will become more and more, will become better and better and, and, and more and more good people and uh, well you know frankly if what we're looking at is a contest between God and the devil you have to conclude that the devil is certainly coming out on top uh, because when you look at what's happening in the world today uh, if this represents God's best effort to save the world, then you, you have to conclude that God has certainly uh, uh, certainly not been doing very well. Well, how did human civilization originate? The world in which we live, where, where did it come from? Who is the real author of this world's civilization and culture? Where do, Does it go back to God? Uh, is, it, uh, is it a Christian civilization that we've inherited? You know, down through history, mankind has developed a variety of cultures and customs, and uh, we want to go into this evening uh, the real origin of human civilization so that we can see where it leads and, and what is ahead. There was a time when a choice was made, and it was a choice that set the stage for the entire future of mankind. And we have to go back to the book of beginnings. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, and that's the place to look to understand the origins of everything that we see around us. Because God tells us where it came from. He tells us where it originated. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we find uh, that when God had created the first man and the first woman, that he placed them somewhere. In Genesis 2-7, we're told that the eternal God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul, became a living being. And the eternal God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God placed the man. And as we see, as you come on down here, that God created, uh, took from the man a rib and, and uh, uh, created a woman. But God placed our first parents in the Garden of Eden. And we find as we come on down that out of, in verse 9, that out of the ground made the eternal God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and all and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there were two trees there in the center part of the garden. One was called the tree of life, and the other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These two trees were symbolic of the fact that God was placing before mankind a choice. Human beings, as we're going to see, elected to establish their own civilization, their own culture, their own uh, society cut off from and apart from God. We have before us that choice. Uh, God explained that choice to ancient Israel. You know, people talk about wanting a choice, and uh, uh, today the, uh, uh, those who are in favor of abortion like to say, well, they're pro-choice. Well... What do you mean pro-choice? You know, the, the only choice they're in favor of you making is the one to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, commit an abortion. That, that's the only choice they're in favor of you making. That's not pro-choice. Uh, you know, well, we want people to have a choice. Well, 
God set before ancient Israel a choice, but He said He defined the choice. He said, I set before you good and evil, life and death, therefore choose life that you and your seed may live. All choices aren't created equal. You know, if, if the car's coming down the road, I've got a choice. I can go stand in the middle of the road in front of the car or I can uh, uh, get out of the way. Uh, now, those are not... One choice isn't just as good as another. Uh, you know, one choice uh, is going to be real serious and the other choice is, is a good choice. Uh, so the idea that we have a choice and that God uh, set before our first parents a choice did not mean uh, that one choice was as good as another. Uh, in fact, God gave specific instructions. We're told in uh, Genesis 2.15 that the eternal God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the eternal God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. So God said, Look, here is here are some instructions. Uh, he said, You can eat of all of these trees, but there is one tree here that you are not to eat of it because if you do, you will die. So we have life and death. We have this set before mankind. Now this tree is not just simply the tree of evil. It is the tree of a mixture of good and evil. And that is what is descriptive of the civilization that man has built. It's not that every facet of civilization that there's nothing good. Well, no, you find people that are kind or that are helpful. Uh, there are principles that are practiced in virtually every culture that may be uh, involve courtesy or kindness or respect. Uh, there are things that have been practiced that are good, but man's civilizations have had and contained a fatal mixture of good and evil. If I brought you a wonderful dish of uh, garden vegetables that have been all fixed up good nutritious the only trouble is I had sprinkled it with arsenic here before I gave it to you well you say well that, those vegetables they're loaded now with vitamins and minerals that's right you know that's good it's also loaded now with arsenic well that's bad so it's a mixture of good and evil it is a fatal mixture good and evil is is a fatal mixture because the evil contaminates the good it has a contaminating effect. God likens sin uh, to leaven. And he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. There is a spreading quality that it has. So God gave to our first parents a choice. God told them what was the right choice and he established that there were consequences for the wrong choices. But nevertheless, uh, he did not insulate them to where there was nothing that they could choose that was wrong. They ultimately were going to have to establish godly character by choosing the right and rejecting the evil. Now, you know, some people misinterpret that, mis misappropriate the example, applying it to their children. Say, well, you know, I give my kids a choice. Uh, it was interesting. I uh, uh, was very gratified to hear a few days ago, was talking with uh, one of our uh, men up in the Lufkin area and he was mentioning a young lady that had visited our services uh, there the previous time and I said well I'm delighted to hear about that I said you know I remember her as a teenager when she was about 16 or 17 and uh, that was back in 1979 when I first moved uh, to Houston and was pastoring Lufkin and her father had been a long time member of the church had become just sort of soured by various problems and various things and, and uh, the result was everything was falling to pot including his own family and and uh, I had heard word that his daughters were uh, going out to the football games on Friday night and various things and I went out to visit him and he said well he said I give my kids a choice you know, the Bible says give them a choice. And I said, well, let me, uh, how do you present that choice to them? Do you say, uh, well, you want to sit home and do nothing or you want to go out and have fun? I said, is that the way you, you present the choice? Is it you, you want to go to the ball game and, and uh, Friday night or you, or you want to sit here with me? I said, how do you present the choice? I said, you know, God 
God presented the choice. When He gave Israel a choice, He said, I set before you good and evil. I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your seed may live. And uh, I said, is that the way you present the choice? Do you, do you make plain that, that there, there, there are two alternative ways of life? One leads to life, one leads to death. That one is right, one is wrong, one is keeping the commandments, one is breaking the commandments. H- how do you present the choice? Well, no, that was, he didn't present the choice the way God presented the choice. You know, frankly, I, I, I thought at the time, his daughters uh, both impressed me as having... Uh, a more receptive and a more teachable attitude and, and uh, uh, it, it seemed to me at the time that with just a little bit of parental guidance uh, there, there was a uh, you know a set there but they, they needed some guidance they needed somebody to, to delineate what were the right and wrong choices and uh, I don't know exactly what's happened to her over the years but I was very gratified to hear that uh, uh, you, you know she is uh, I, I knew at one time years ago she had just sort of dropped out and, and, and had quit attending anywhere way back, you know, that's been what, 16 years ago. And uh, uh, the point is, God gives us a choice and He makes plain what the choice is. And He told Adam and Eve, I've set before you a choice, uh, good and evil. And he gave, in, he gave instructions about which was the proper choice. Now, so we see that man had, uh, that God established a, uh, God established a structure. We look here at the origins uh, of the whole future of mankind, of mankind civilization. You know, Mr. Armstrong uh, used to keep going back to the two trees. And uh, needless to say, we haven't heard a lot about the two trees in quite a few years. But, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, one tree got chosen and the other tree got left. And I think we know which was which. <laughs> and uh, uh, somebody's been eating the, I don't know about the poison mushrooms, but maybe the poison apples or something, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, anyway, what we find here is that God set a choice. And that mankind had in this context, right here in Genesis 2 and 3 and 4, this section we find that the trajectory was being set for the entire future of humanity. Now, let's look at a couple of other things about civilization because there's certain things that have come down. What about the, uh, the family structure, the traditional family structure? A husband and wife that marry and uh, marry for life and produce and raise children. Uh, is this something that human beings just simply came up with? You know, you listen to some of these evolutionists. Well, you know, these animals do it this way, and 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 these, uh, and they come up with just all sorts of crazy things because they go back, they go to the wrong place, and they talk about different marriage customs, and and uh, uh, they they even change the wording on the census documents because uh, when they had a uh, White House conference on families, uh, they had trouble defining what is a family because uh, uh, you, you know the lesbians wanted one thing, and and this bunch wanted something else, and. It's just a bunch of craziness. Well, the origin of the family goes back to the very... That's the most basic fundamental building block of civilization. And it goes back to the very beginning. God established the most fundamental building block of civilization. He he established the family. And we notice right here in Genesis 1... 27 and 28, we find that God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So we find that God made mankind in his image, mankind, male and female, in the image of God. So there is a status that we all share as human beings There is a status of human beings in the image of God that we all have. Whether we're men or women, whether we're black or white, regardless of of any of the physical distinctions, there is a status that we share as human beings made in the image of God and therefore deserving of of appropriate honor and respect uh, for being just that, for being human beings. Now... Just as there, God established a status, uh, the human life is, is far different than animal life. Human beings are made in His image, which gives us a status that sets us apart from all animal life. 
country, dogs, cats, cows, horses, all of this, they have value basically based on, on usefulness uh, to mankind, whether usefulness as a uh, for food or usefulness as a pet or usefulness as a draft animal. Uh, their value is based on their use to human beings. Human beings have an intrinsic value because we are made in the image of God. Now, let's go on a little further. We find that in addition to our status as human beings, there is also a function that we have within the human status. You see, and this is, of course, where a lot of the modern uh, uh, grew, the, 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 some of the feminists and some of these go off the deep end, is they want to say, well, every function ought to be identical. See, equality, uh, they, they misunderstand equality because the Bible talks about if you mean we're, we're equal in several ways, you know. Uh, Solomon explains the most fundamental way we're equal. Uh, back in Ecclesiastes, he says, uh, uh, all go to one place. Uh, you, you know, we, we go back to the dust. Uh, so whether you're rich or poor, wise or foolish, uh, uh, male or female, regardless of race, regardless of anything, the great leveler is death. It brings everybody to the same place and we're all become equally dead and equally in need of the resurrection, uh, equally in need of a Savior. And the Scripture talks about equality before the law in the sense that you uh, treat people fairly, that you, uh, uh, you don't take advantage of anyone. Uh, regardless of, of their, you know, their, their particular place in the community. But the Bible doesn't teach that, that uh, uh, there is no difference in the functions uh, that we were intended to perform. Because uh, in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. I'm going to make a partner for him. I'm going to make a helper that's exactly compatible, that will fit with him. And down in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept, took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh, and the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. God established marriage. He established the family. He established the structure of a husband and wife. God created one man and one woman. He didn't create one man and a whole bunch of women. He didn't create one woman and a whole bunch of men. He created one man and one woman, which Christ quoted to the Pharisees later on, you know, when they were uh, wanting to argue and harangue about divorce and remarriage and, and argue about the law. And he said, Have you not read that he which at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So Adam, God established the, the family structure. And he had to explain that to Adam because when he said, You know, you, you're, for this cause shall you leave your father and mother and cleave to your wife, Adam would have, his logical question would have been, What's a father and mother? See, he, hadn't, he didn't have one. God had to explain to Adam what the structure of the family was intended to be. And God told him, uh, you know, in effect, perform the first wedding ceremony. God had to explain to Adam what the family was supposed to be like. He said, "Well, you're starting out as man and woman, as man and wife, husband and wife, and you'll have children, and they will grow up, and they will need to then leave your home. You'll be the father, and he will be the mother, and they'll need to leave and establish their own family unit." And he had to explain that to Adam in terms of the family and how it was intended to function. So, the, the origin of the family and the proper role of the family, the defining uh, aspect of the family, we look right back here. God established that. He established settled agriculture to be the basis of human civilization. Uh, we find He put, uh, the, took the man, Genesis 2.15, put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You know, a lot of uh, evolutionists have the idea, well, you know, people wandered around as hunters and gatherers for a long time, and, and, and uh, well, God put them in the garden. He gave them instruction about agriculture, about how to take care of the ground, uh, how to uh, take care of the plants, to dress it and to keep it. Uh, he didn't create mankind simply uh, to, to live in some sort of a savage state. Uh, God established agriculture as really the basis of, of society and the community. Uh, that uh, 
you know, gives, I, I, frankly, it gives a stability uh, that way. I think a lot of the social problems we're having in our nation is the more urbanized we have become, uh, the more that people are removed from what God created. You know, when, you, when you're dependent on what grows out of the ground about whether or not you eat, uh, it does have something to do with, with sort of focusing you on, on who's the source of everything. You know, today people think that uh, you know all they're dependent on is, is what's in the uh, what's in the supermarket. Well, where did they get it in the supermarket? It came ultimately came out of the ground. But the further removed people get from what comes from God, and the more they are uh, with what comes from from simply from uh, man's technology, uh, it, it has an effect. Well, as we come on down we find that right at the beginning God established a structure he has set up the family but you know Satan has been out to undermine the governmental structure that God created by trying to get to the man through his wife and God uh, Satan has worked to distort uh, and disrupt the family structure God created Adam and Eve to function uh, as partners he, he established uh, a, a structure uh, there was a difference in structure that uh, is, is explained in Hebrews in First Corinthians eleven three that uh, that uh, Christ is the head of the man and God is the head of Christ and the man is the head of the woman and, and there there is a structure that comes down but you know God created Adam and Eve as as a team they were partners she was a help meet for him and so what we've seen through time is primarily. A matter of either uh, men abusing uh, their authority to sort of uh, grind down uh, their wives or the, the flip side, as we see so prevalent in our society, of things swinging to the opposite end. Uh, Satan has always wanted to undermine the family, to make it something other than what God intended it to be. And that's what we see in Genesis 3.1. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the eternal God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And uh, so he begins to get to the woman. He is trying to undermine the structure in, in the family. So he doesn't go to Adam. Uh, he, he is uh, uh, he's trying to disrupt the harmony of the family by, by not following the structure that God has, has set in motion. So we find uh, that as we come on down, uh, he talks to her about eating of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And we find in verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. See, there are two sources of, of information. One source of information is revealed knowledge. That's what God reveals. This book is filled with revealed knowledge. The other source of knowledge is knowledge that is derived from the five physical senses. What does it look like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? What, what does it sound like? Uh, you know, what does it feel like? Dependent on the five physical senses. Now, Eve, at this point, had a choice. She knew that God had said that they were not to eat of that tree. Satan appealed to her to allow her human reasoning to override God's revelation. If God says something and you can't quite understand why, does that mean, well... If I don't see what difference it makes, I guess I just ought to go ahead and do whatever, you know, seems good. You know, Mr. Armstrong said over the years, and I think most of us heard him many times, that he and Mrs. Armstrong kept the holy days for seven years by themselves. He didn't know what they meant. He didn't understand the meaning of the holy days and how the whole plan of God was revealed. What he saw was that God said, do it. Nobody else agreed with him. And he didn't understand why, but God said it, and so he did it. Now, that is an important key. 
You see, people say, well, if, if, if I don't see what difference it makes. Well, if God said it made a difference to Him, then just do it. And maybe after you've done it for a while, you'll see what difference it makes. See, the key is that revelation is the overriding source of knowledge. See, a lot of times, if we base our decisions on what we see, on what we feel, those are all human. Those are very fallible. You know, the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps, Jeremiah said. See, our feelings can, uh, our feelings are there, and that's the way we feel, but just because we feel that way doesn't mean it's, it's something that's right and good. You know, maybe we feel uh, hatred, or uh, maybe we feel lust, or maybe we feel envy, or maybe we, we can feel a lot of things. Just because we feel that way doesn't mean we ought to go ahead and do it. Well, that's, you know, that's just what I feel like. See, God's revelation has to be the overriding guiding force. God told him, he said, leave it alone. Don't touch this one. That's a bad choice. You don't want to take that because if you eat of it, you will die. The devil came along and he said, how do you know? You see, man has been all through human history trying to prove by scientific experiment whether or not they can make the devil's way work. And we've had every sort of ism and every sort of governmental structure. And people still haven't given up on the fact that if they can just get the right guy elected, he's going to solve all the problems. Now, how many thousand years have they been spending trying to get the right guy in? And none of the right guys have ever turned out to be quite the right guy. They promise a new deal, and when it's all over with, it's the same old raw deal. It's just sort of uh, wrapped up in different packaging. I grant you some deals may be a little worse than others, but the bottom line is none of them have ever really solved the problem. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. But that's where it goes back to right here in Genesis 3. See, man rejected, mankind rejected the revelation of God and therefore God's government. Because the ultimate government of God is based on God's commandments. You know, sometimes people have wanted to misuse the government of God and they, well, you know, it's God's government, it's God's government. Well, God's government isn't just whatever uh, some man says do if God said didn't, uh, says don't do it. Uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't work that way. You know, Saul was, was, uh, uh, was the king, but when he uh, came down there and he was upset at the priests, uh, down there at, at the uh, area of Nob, and he told his soldiers, he said, kill those priests. And they wouldn't do it, which was good. There was an Edomite there that was willing to do it. He didn't care. He had no fear of God. But some of those other men had, had respect for God, and they said, we're not going we're not, we're not to lift up our sword against the priests there. You see, they understood that Saul didn't have the right to teach contrary to what God said. Satan was coming along. You know, he was the one that God, God had allowed Satan to be on earth. So God hadn't removed Satan. Satan was there. Satan was the one that God had placed in charge over the angels. Satan rebelled, and his angels followed him in rebellion. And now he shows up. And in his own clever way, he is trying to undermine God and saying, you, you know, you don't have to just do what God says. Well, we, mankind has been following this way ever since uh, of relying on human reasoning. Relying on the five physical senses and what seems right. You know, Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. God's revelation is the only thing you and I can count on. And that, of course, brings us to the result of Adam and Eve made a choice. And uh, we find in verse 7 here of Genesis 3, The eyes of them both were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons, heard the voice of the eternal God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the, gar the trees of the garden. And the Lord God said unto Adam, and he said, Where are you? And he said, Well, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
Well, as we come on down, you know, we find that ultimately, verse 23, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice, and by that choice they cut themselves off from God. They separated themselves from God. And mankind, the descendants of Adam and Eve, have been cut off from God ever since. And the only way that we can have access to God is that God chooses to make Himself accessible, to call. Of course, we have to choose to answer. People people talk about God calling. Well, that's right, God calls, but you know, uh, we have to answer. Christ pictures Himself... Uh, knocking at the door, but you know, somebody knocks at the door, you have to make a choice of whether or not you open uh, the door. So, we see here the basis of, of what happened that mankind made choices. Going back to our first parents, they made a choice to rely on human reasoning and the five physical senses in preference to, relying on the revelation of God and man's choices have cut mankind off from from God, from really walking with God and really uh, knowing God. You see, all subsequent human beings derive from Adam and Eve. That's proven right here in Genesis 3.20. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. See, all human beings derive back to Mother Eve. And her name, Eve, is derived from the Hebrew word uh, kava, which means literally life. And uh, so he called her name life. She was to be the mother of all living. Now, we find that mankind built up a civilization, and man's civilization stems from this account right here in Genesis 3. We see the origin of human civilization. We see that human civilization has been built up, cut off from God. Adam and Eve made a choice and all subsequent human beings have been impacted by that choice. Now, Eve was deceived. She was deceived by Satan the devil. And it's very plain when we look back in Revelation chapter 12 that that same Satan has been deceiving the descendants of Adam and Eve uh, ever since. Revelation 12, verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we find that Satan the devil has deceived the whole world. He deceived Eve. Adam wasn't deceived uh, in the sense that, that he knew that he wasn't supposed to do it, but he was weak. And he was allowed himself to uh, uh, go along with what his uh, what his wife wanted to do uh, against his better judgment. He knew he shouldn't, uh, but he was weak, and so he gave in through uh, through weakness. Uh, and uh, uh, but Satan has been working on human beings ever since. So we we find in Genesis chapters two and three the story of a choice that sent the tone for the entire future of the history of mankind. The origin of man's civilization goes back to events that happened in the Garden of Eden almost 6,000 years ago. Now, you know, that's not where the history books start. Uh, that's not, uh, but that's where the real history book starts. That's where the, 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 real, uh, the real origin of human civilization now, this pattern of, of civilization that was established by the family of Adam and Eve continued on. Over the course of the next uh, generations, the foundations uh, of, of early civ- uh, human civilization were, were laid and built upon by Adam and Eve's children. And there are certainly lessons that apply to us today. Because Jesus Christ... Uh, said that the world as it existed in the pre-flood world, the world prior to the flood of Noah, was a time that paralleled, or that would parallel, the times in which we're living and the times ahead of us. He said that 
as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So there is a distinct parallel. There is a pattern of human nature. And so uh, in the remainder here of the Bible study, we're going to focus in a little bit on the story of the pre-flood world and understand a little bit uh, as to what was involved. This is on the back side here of uh, uh, the story of the pre-flood world. Now, let's go back here to Genesis chapter 4 and let's understand a little bit. We find that Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden and in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, we find that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man... Uh, literally as it, as it is in the Hebrew I have gotten a man the eternal and she again bore or she added in bearing his brother Abel now uh, the Jewish commentators bring out that, that uh, this, this wording is an indication of that Cain and Abel were twins uh, it doesn't say uh, as it normally does that Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Abel it just said she again bore or she added in bearing Abel so very likely Cain and Abel were twins uh, but they were very different twins Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the eternal and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof and the eternal had respect unto Abel and to his offering but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell Cain got upset he was mad because God didn't like his sacrifice as well as Cain's as well as Abel's he obviously had not followed the instructions he wanted to do it his own way and was upset because his way wasn't uh, acceptable and God told him he said why are you upset why is your countenance fallen verse 7 if you do well, shall you not be accepted? You know, if you do what you're supposed to do, that'll be accepted. If you do not well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be its desire, but you must rule over it. In other words, he warned Cain. He said, Cain, if you do what you're supposed to do, it's, it's not that I like Abel and don't like you. But Abel's actions, are the actions that I request. If you do what you're supposed to do, you'll be accepted as well. But be warned, sin lies at the door. Sin is waiting there, crouching, ready to pounce. Its desire is going to be to pull you down. You've got to overcome it. You've got to master it. So Cain was given a sermon on overcoming. So when it was not just because he had brought a different he just hadn't brought... In other words, if he would have brought the very best of what he did, right. it would have been all right. It says right here, uh, you see that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. It didn't say he brought the first fruits. It didn't say he... he uh, it says that of Abel, that Abel uh, brought of the firstlings of his flock. See, Abel brought the best. It says Cain just simply brought of the fruit of the ground. I think there are probably a couple of different things here. One, the, the grain offerings were considered a thank offering. It was an offering of thanksgiving and appreciation. But the offering of an animal, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I think the, the other aspect of it was that Cain begrudgingly brought a thank offering but it wasn't very much of a thank offering it, it, it was of the fruit of the ground it wasn't the best that he had it was sort of he had uh, uh, you know a few old scraggly ears of corn left over and he decided to bring those to God uh, so ultimately it was his attitude I think the aspect Cain did not indicate by his offering that he recognized his need for a savior and uh, I you know, God had given indication back with Adam and Eve in the garden when He slew the animal and made of the and made of the uh, hide of the animal, made of the uh, coat of the animal, uh, a covering for Adam and Eve. And 
undoubtedly explain to them uh, about everything from from slaughter of animals to uh, um, you know the preparation of, of uh, uh, you know the preparation of, of food to the to uh, offerings all the things that were involved because when he did this uh, Adam and Eve were there they'd never seen anything like this before and and uh, undoubtedly it was it was used to teach a certain lesson but what we find is that Cain was not one who really valued God. Uh, rather, we're told that, uh, you know, by, by Josephus, the Jewish historian, that Cain was a covetous man, wholly intent upon getting. He wanted what he could get. Undoubtedly begrudged God even what he, what he brought. And, and, and as, you know, again, uh, Abel brought, of the first, uh, brought the firstlings. Uh, Cain just simply brought of the fruit of the ground. He just brought something. And was upset then because God approved of what Abel had done. Abel's attitude, the real, the, the God looks on the heart, you see, and the real key was the fact that that Abel did what he did from the heart, and he 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 gave to God the best that he had. Cain, that was not his motive, not his attitude, and he didn't take the correction well. He held a grudge against. Uh, uh, his brother, and when he had the opportunity, he murdered him. We're told this in Genesis 4, verse 8. So, uh, you know, Cain was not a practitioner of brotherly love. John John explains that back in 1 John chapter 3. You see, in this world, civilization has not been built on love your neighbor as yourself. Cain set the tone for much of the pre-flood civilization. 1 John three twelve tells us, well, let's notice First uh, John three eleven. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You see, John says, look, don't be surprised if the world hates you. The world has hated the people of God since the world began. Cain hated Abel, and he killed him. And so don't be surprised if the world hates you, because Cain began this world's civilization. He was the one who, as we're going to see a little later, is credited with building the first city. And uh, what we find is that Cain was not... Adam and Eve made a choice, a choice to place human reasoning and information derived from the five senses above revelation. Cain built on that choice to establish a civilization based on get. Interestingly, the very name Cain, the word Cain, means get in Hebrew. So here was little get, and he was, uh, you know, he, he grew up uh, getting and wanting to get more. He established the whole way of mankind civilization, the way of Gat. And it was not the way of brotherly love. Man's civilization has not been built on brotherly love. It's been built on Gat. It's been built on uh, getting even and hurting those that uh, uh, persecution of the righteous. All of this, and that's, that's what goes right back to the beginning. But God put a curse on Cain and, and to drive him forth from the rest of the human family. We find that here in Genesis 4.11. God said, You're cursed from the earth, which opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall you be in the earth. And Cain immediately began to feel sorry for himself and say, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Woe is me. You've driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from your face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond, and everybody that finds me is going to kill me. No, everybody that finds you won't kill you, just the first one. Well, no, uh, that's not true either. But sort of get the idea, Cain was really feeling a little sorry for himself now. Oh, woe is me. God put a curse on him. One thing, he was going to put him out of the farming business. We're not told exactly what uh, Cain uh, did, though there is indication. Josephus talks about the fact that Cain forced the ground. 
Now, in certain uh, primitive, you know, certain societies, certain uh, uh, there's what's called a splash and burn agriculture, where they come in simply burn off an area, uh, plant a crop, reap it, go on, burn off something else the next year. Uh, you know that sort of thing, which uh, you figure that Cain was trying to get the most for the least. He was not one who was con- who was concerned about being a good steward of the earth. Uh, he was uh, destructive. Uh, in that way, and, and uh, was not one who uh, who really valued uh, the resources that God had had provided. God put him out of business, uh, made him uh, condemned him to wander as a fugitive, as a vagabond, sent him forth, and uh, um, the uh, so we're told in verse sixteen. Cain went out from the presence of the Eternal and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So. Cain was expelled from where the rest of the human family lived. By this time, Adam and Eve, we're not told how many years it transpired, but uh, uh, obviously a number had gone by, uh, enough so that Adam and Eve had a number of, uh, of uh, children, and uh, the human family was still, uh, was still very small. But uh, it's amazing how quickly uh, things uh, occur over a period of, of a few Generations, you know, particularly if uh, uh, if large families were uh, were, were involved. We, this past uh, a little earlier this summer, uh, my wife has one uh, grandmother who's still living, uh, who is uh, what, ninety. Yes, she, she's ninety four this summer, and uh, she had a large family. She had eight children, and and uh, her um, many of her children had sizable families. By the time you got down to the third generation, the size of the families uh, really started shrinking, but uh, uh, we had a family reunion, and we, we counted it up that most of them were able to be... Uh, that doesn't count the in-laws. That's just uh, direct descendants. Uh, my wife and I got to figuring uh, just a little bit that if, uh, if her children and, and grandchildren had had the same size family that she had, Instead of there being 122, it would be up approaching 500. Uh, and that's only over a period of about 75 years uh, since uh, uh, since the time she was married. So uh, you, I bring this out simply to show that within a relatively short period of time, uh, you start extrapolating some of that out, you see, uh, over over a period of time, and you realize that uh, numbers can increase uh, very rapidly from from a relatively small number. Uh, within a period of a hundred years, you can be talking uh, of a very sizable uh, number of people. So it didn't take uh, at that time when there was not uh, you know there was not disease, uh, there was verdant land everywhere. The whole earth lay before them. How long did it take the family of Adam and Eve to increase? Uh, and to multiply out, you know, as a few generations went by, uh, not long at all. And so the population began to increase. Cain was exiled, uh, but we're told that uh, God set up a, a, a mark. Uh, a lot of people have speculated about that if, in verse 15. If you look up the, the Hebrew term uh, that's translated mark, uh, it's a term that is mark, sign, flag, uh, beacon, uh, marker. Uh, it, it is some sort of uh, signal, some sort of flag, some sort of, of beacon or boundary marker that delineated the land of Nod, where Cain was exiled, from the land of Eden, where the, the, uh, where the rest of the family was to be. And uh, so I think it's uh, very likely it was in the form of a boundary marker that uh, was erected there uh, that, that marked the spot beyond which no one else was to go, and Cain was not uh, to come back. Uh, and it very likely Cain and perhaps his uh, descendants uh, maybe began wearing at a later date uh, a replica of that uh, uh, of that boundary marker as sort of a, uh, you know, corrupting the significance of it into some sort of a good luck charm or protection charm. You know, where does where, where does wearing uh, some sort of a uh, you know some some sort of a uh, of a, uh, a good luck charm or or uh, uh, an amulet or something of that sort. Where does that originate? Well, very likely, I, I think it went back here. What was a, uh, initially intended as identification 
uh, was corrupted in its significance and was applied in a way that uh, as though somehow this is protection. Well, no. Uh, it, it was there to identify. It was to mark. It was to identify. The uh, Cain was driven forth, but we find that in verse 17, Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch. And we find that a little later, Cain built a city, and he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, the city was undoubtedly... Uh, more of what we would think of as a little fort or castle uh, that uh, was built. Uh, Cain probably built it in an area where he was uh, in, in a position to protect himself and his family. Uh, you, you can imagine that uh, as he would have uh, sought to make a prey, you know, sought to, to begin to uh, take advantage of others. Uh, we find as we come on down through the family of Cain uh, that they were... Uh, that metal working and, and the uh, manufacture of, of uh, implements of war, uh, weapons of war, uh, originated with the family of Cain. Uh, we find uh, on down uh, in verse 22 of Genesis 4 that uh, uh, one of Cain's descendants, Lamech, uh, by his wife Zillah, bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in, uh, of brass and iron. Or uh, you know, one who was uh, uh, actually the name Tubal Cain. Cain means get. Tubal Cain means getter of wealth. Uh, so you sort of get the idea as to what he manufactured uh, or what he started working with brass and iron to do. Uh, you, you know, this was the beginning of the arms race. Uh, the first guy that made a, a metal weapon, he was one up on the guy that only had a stick. Uh, you know, he had a sword. Now he chopped the stick in two. So uh, this was the beginning of the arms race. Sometimes people think that uh, uh, they solve all the problems of violence. All they have to do is, uh, uh, you know, register the handguns. Well, that's, you know, they need to go back and read Genesis 4. Uh, Cain didn't have a Saturday night special. Uh, he just picked up a stick and hit his brother in the head. Uh, you know, the problem is, is in the attitude and the hearts and minds of people. You may make it a little more convenient. Somebody may have to throw a rock or pick up a club. But they'll, you know, technology marches on. They, they start out throwing the rock, and then somebody figures out how to make a slingshot so he can shoot the rock. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, he, he starts out and he picks up a stick, and then he figures out how to make a bow and arrow or, or how to make a spear. Somebody else comes along and figures out how to work with metal. Uh, and, and man's technology has moved on. But... Uh, the, uh, the family of Cain pioneered in, in this area. Uh, Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian, tells us that uh, Tubal Cain, quote, exceeded all men in strength and was very expert and famous in martial performances. He procured what tended to the pleasures of the body by that method. And first of all, invented the art of making brass. So Tubal Cain, uh, the, the family of Cain, initiated and originated an, an approach toward life. Uh, the uh, uh, even in terms of music here when it talks about Jubal the, the father of such as handle the harp and organ well uh, that word uh, handle could also mean to seize or to profane uh, undoubtedly when, when you get the whole picture there was a corrupting influence uh, it was the initiating city life and you find the, the violence, you find the corrupt music, you find all of the things that could have a negative influence that were there. That the family of Cain was instrumental uh, in things that, in misusing talents and abilities, you know, to, to, to construct a metal plow or a metal hoe or a metal shovel, uh, could have been very, very helpful. And they may have made some of those, but it didn't take them long to corrupt uh, some of this and to use metal to uh, uh, make implements of war, things to, uh, to hurt, to seize, to, uh, uh, to do uh, different things. So we see that uh, uh, the origin of, of, uh, uh, of civilization that is described right here and uh, where it originated. As we come on down, we find in verse 25 of, of Genesis 4 that Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called his name Seth. 
For God, said she, has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, or uh, to... Uh, there are a couple of ways it could be rendered. The, the marginal rendering here is to uh, uh, call themselves by the name of the Lord, uh, which uh, I think ties in with Genesis 6.1 when you... Uh, uh, or Genesis 6-2 when it talks about individuals called the sons of God uh, seeing the daughters of men that they were fair and taking them wives of whomsoever they chose uh, that uh, the pagan mythology dates back where does it? Where does false religion go back to? it goes back to Cain it uh, goes back to the pre-flood world uh, here we have uh, civilization uh, with, with city life with uh, military with all of the er- various areas. It's interesting if you go back and you look at what is laid out uh, in Egyptian mythology at the uh, at what is is brought out. You find that uh, uh, they introduce uh, two uh, first man and woman, or they they introduce the original uh, the, the the names for the original god and goddess. Uh, or the, uh, the the first parents, and and then and they, they don't really have a whole lot about them. But then they go down to their son, uh, who was the inventor of agriculture and the one who was the giver of civilization, very much descriptive of Cain. Uh, and uh, uh, they identified uh, uh, him as Horus, uh, and uh, they countered with Seth. Uh, who was the uh, the and, and this is exactly the story you find here. You come on down through uh, these things. You find that there was a time when men uh, began, as it indicates here in, in 426, to call themselves by the name of the Lord. Uh, they began to appropriate the name of God. Undoubtedly, the family of Cain, uh, viewing him in, in later time as being uh, as worthy of worship and Cain uh, began, uh, being the focus of, of much of that. Uh, it's interesting that Saturn, the father of the gods uh, in, in Greek and Roman mythology, the Hebrew uh, word for that's translated in, in Genesis 4.14 where it says, From your face shall I be hid. The term in Hebrew, shall I be hid or I shall be hid, is the Hebrew word Satur, S-A-T-U-R. And this is the origin of the of the name Saturn, the hidden god. Uh, this is the term that uh, Cain applied to himself. Uh, so later on when we find that the sons of God, the descendants of Cain, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of whomsoever they chose. You know, some, some tried to say, well, the sons of God, maybe that was talking about the angels. Well, there's nothing in this context about any sin that angels were committing the result of this was in verse 3 God said my spirit shall not always strive with man he didn't say I'm not going to always strive with, with angels and of course we're told in, in uh, uh, we're told uh, elsewhere that uh, you know angels neither uh, uh, neither marry nor are given in marriage uh, there's no indication that a- angels can marry or mate in fact Christ says that angels don't marry, uh, but we do find that there were there were individuals. Now, the term sons of God can be used in several ways. It's used to refer to Adam as being a son of God by creation. It's used to refer to righteous, uh, the righteous as being the sons of God. Uh, clearly, the ones mentioned in Genesis 6-2 weren't the righteous. They were doing something that God wasn't pleased with. Uh, they weren't referring to angels. So the only thing left is human beings that appropriated to themselves divine titles. Those who were involved in the beginnings of false religion and appropriated to themselves divine titles. And uh, uh, undoubtedly the family of Cain that that we find here. And so there began to be the wrong kinds of marriages. They took, they saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all whom they chose. 
Now you see, God originally divided and separated the nations, and He divided and separated the various races. Uh, and it goes back to the time of Adam. God says in Genesis and Deuteronomy chapter thirty-two. Deuteronomy 32, verse uh, 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he'll show you, your elders and they'll tell you. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. God originally separated the sons of Adam. The the racial groupings go back to, to the time of Adam. God built in to Mother Eve uh, the... Uh, into the uh, the uh, uh, the ova that were in in her womb, uh, he built in the characteristics, uh, not of her parents because she didn't have it. He built in the characteristics that would give rise to the various racial groups. It's not an accident. It's not a matter of evolution. God intended from the beginning that the human family would be differentiated into various groups, various families. And God designed that in. And He separated out the sons of Adam. He designed that they would go to different areas and settle. But we find that mankind never wants to do things the way God established them. So it wasn't long uh, before some of these uh, descendants of Cain who took to themselves divine titles were beginning to uh, take wives whomever they chose regardless of God's instruction. And uh, uh, you know, God obviously intended... The uh, the various groupings that, that descended from the family of from the sons of Adam uh, to separate and preserve their identity as individual groups to spread out to populate the entire earth. He had it divided up. God knew about the children of Israel before He ever got started. You know, uh, you read in the he- you read in Revelation that the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, uh, has twelve gates and their name for the twelve tribes of Israel. God didn't just look down one day and see a man with 12 sons and say, boy, I'm so impressed by that. I think I'll build a city and name the gates after his kids. Uh, You know, it's ridiculous. God had the city, the New Jerusalem, designed before, uh, before the foundation of the world, before anything was ever started. God knew where he was going before he started. That's why when he gets there, he'll be where he wants to be. God had in mind the structure. He had in mind the whole system. And that was brought out uh, right there uh, with, with Genesis uh, with uh, Revelation. Uh, so when you find in Deuteronomy 32 that he that he divided the nations and he had in mind the number of the children of Israel, God had in mind from the beginning where ultimately the twelve tribes would be and how they would spread out and, and the relationship. God had in mind from the beginning because ultimately everybody who comes in, all of the inhabitants of the new earth who enter into the New Jerusalem will have to come in by one of the twelve gates. They will have to come in and relate to God, to the family of God, through one of the tribes of Israel, through one of the twelve gates. God had in mind the structure that He was going to end up with in Revelation. He had that in mind from the beginning in Genesis. And Satan has always wanted to thwart God's plan and always seeks to do that. And to if God was going to divide out the human family into different groupings, then Satan was going to come around and try to stir everybody up uh, to, to let's just get rid of any distinctions and let's just uh, have one. Well, you know, the easy thing would have been to have had one if God hadn't supernaturally uh, done something in Eve's womb uh, to begin with in terms of establishing, building in the characteristics that would be uh, encoded the genetic code in each uh, in each of them, uh, each little egg cell, then everybody would come out uh, pretty well, just like Adam and Eve. And uh, so, obviously, God uh, had a plan and, and a purpose in that regard. And we find that uh, it wasn't long before God's instructions regarding appropriate marriages uh, were disregarded. Uh, that uh, uh, we find taking wives of whomsoever they chose and God said my spirit will not always strive with man he is flesh his days are going to be 120 years we find there were giants in the earth in those days and this expression uh, does not necessarily mean giant in size the, uh, there are two different words that are translated giants uh, in uh, 
uh, in the Bible. One is the Nephilim, and this is the term used here. Uh, Rephaim is the term used back in uh, uh, Deuteronomy, for instance, where it refers to uh, uh, the giants in the land. Uh, Deuteronomy 2, uh, verse 11, talks about... Uh, 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 well, in Deuteronomy 2, uh, verse 10, the, the uh, M.M.'s uh, dwelt therein in times past, the people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which were also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them uh, Emims. And um, the, this, uh, this is in, in Deuteronomy 2, 10, and 11. The word is translated giant uh, in size back in Deuteronomy 2, 11 is the Hebrew word Rephaim. But the term used here is a different word, and it literally uh, the, uh, uh, refers to, uh, to, to something uh, a, uh, that was a little different. It, it, it basically refers to uh, uh, those who were, uh, well, uh, I- individuals who were uh, people of, of uh, violence or... Um, uh, individuals of uh, of note in that way, uh, the uh, uh, individuals who were uh, uh, who were violent or who were abusive uh, in certain ways. Uh, these, uh, so we find that civilization became increasingly violent. Everything was corrupted uh, as all of these wrong marriages were taking place uh, that the, there was a corrupting element on civilization people became uh, less considerate of one another and uh, God said in verse 5 of, of Genesis 6 that the, he saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth God was just so disgusted with what he saw and the way people had corrupted themselves and all of the violence. Uh, we're told on down here uh, in verse 11, the earth also was corrupted before God and the earth was filled with violence. Society became increasingly hostile and violent and all sorts of strife and difficulty. Uh, Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24, Matthew 24 in verse 37, he says, as the days of Noah were, so also, so shall also this coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. That's not necessarily wrong to eat and drink or to marry or to give in marriage, but we're told that uh, what God saw when He looked on the earth was that... Uh, the earth was filled with violence, that it was corrupt, uh, that uh, uh, the earth was filled with violence in, in Genesis 6.13, uh, that uh, uh, what God saw was that the imagination of people's, of the thoughts of people's heart was only evil continually. Uh, it, it was uh, just a, a continual uh, focus on that sort of thing. So obviously, uh, a lot of the eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage was not only the indication that that everybody was oblivious of what was coming until the flood came. That's one aspect of of what it says in Matthew 24. The other uh, implication clearly is that it was a time when society was going to excess. There were the wrong kinds of marriages and the wrong kinds of eating and drinking. Uh, The people were not... uh, that, That every aspect of their lives was displeasing to God. Things were becoming increasingly corrupt and violent. And, and the whole, uh, it, it, there was a deterioration uh, in everything, every aspect. So the result was of man building his own civilization cut off from God was that the earth became corrupt and filled with violence. You see, God allowed mankind to see the record of what happened. Cain was allowed to live. Cain killed Abel. God could have executed him on the spot. He chose not to do so. What was the result? The result was within a matter of time, violence filled the earth. You see, God, in effect, told man, if you want to learn by experiment and experience, I'll let you write the lesson of experience. See what happens. 
there is a corrupting influence. Corruption spreads. Cain was a murderer from the beginning. And we find that within his family that there was this attitude of violence, of get, of, of take, uh, and, and it had a corrupting influence and eventually is uh, just absolutely corrupted uh, all mankind. Everybody, uh, humanity became caught up in this sort of thing. And we see that in our society today. We see that a corrupting influence spreads. It, it, uh, we see a deterioration because a corrupting influence has a way of spreading. Now, you know, God raised up work to warn the world of His judgment. Uh, we find right here, uh, you know, God began to deal with Noah and He told Noah to build an ark uh, back in uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse uh, 5, we find that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah not only built an ark, he preached the truth. He was doing the work of God. God warned the world through Noah, but the world didn't listen. So here we find, we can read also of Enoch, uh, who was uh, described, he was the seventh from Adam, and he was uh, also a preacher of righteousness. Uh, God has had his servants. Uh, we, we read... Uh, uh, you know, you can read of, of Enoch uh, back in uh, in the 14th uh, verse of, of the book of Jude. Uh, you can read uh, as to how he prophesied of God's judgment. God has allowed man to carve out his own civilization. Man is elected to build his own civilization on his own ideas cut off from God. And the result has been a corrupt, violent society. God has at various times intervened with His judgment and God has raised up His servants in various generations to warn the world, particularly when God's judgment was at hand. And so that's what we find Christ drawing the parallel to the days of Noah uh, there in Matthew 24 uh, when uh, when He talked about that. That... Uh, uh, that that was going to that is going to be the case that as in the as the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be people are going to go about their activities caught up in an increasingly decadent and corrupt society a society that has its origins with one false choice choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in preference to choosing the tree of life. Mankind has made a wrong choice, has pursued that wrong choice. And the result has been a civilization that is not reflective of God's values. And when we go down through this and we look at the story of the pre-flood world, we find over and over again the, the evidence that when man elected to build his own society, his own civilization, cut off from God, uh, he made a very faithful error, uh, an error that has uh, had very serious, uh, very serious effect on all of human society. This, this civilization, this human society, this is not God's world. This does not reflect uh, God's values. Now, this civilization is not a Christian civilization, but it is a civilization that goes back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is a mixture of truth and error and the only way that we can have something based on truth without the admixture of error is that we have to utilize the revelation of God as the basis of what we've done God has chosen to call some out of this world to open their minds to understand his truth there's a time coming when Jesus Christ is going to return in power and glory to establish the kingdom of God, the government of God, to restore the government of God to this earth. And we have the opportunity of being called of God to be a part of that.